Hi guys, I'm Anjali from Simply Learn. Now, if you have been following our playlist on Python, by now you have probably completed all the basic concepts of Python. So today we'll use these basic concepts in creating a website using Python again. Now this application is called Django. And before we move into actually developing the website, let's better understand what Django is. So Django is a high level Python web framework. So when you compare Django to many of its other counterparts, such as Flask, which also uses Python, it provides very limited freedom. But then again, this limited freedom does mean that it makes development much faster. And that is the goal of Django. So if you are a complete beginner with web development and also sort of with Python, this is the place to start. So Django has a free and a paid version. But since we are just learning how it works, we can go for the free version. In fact, the paid version is only required when it's utilized by companies where they perform a lot of modifications to the point that it's actually unrecognizable. Now, some of the companies which are using Django are Instagram, Bitbucket, Pinterest, and even NASA. Now, there's another important thing that we need to understand about Django, which is its design pattern. So Django follows the MTV design pattern, where MTV stands for Model Template View. These terms may seem very remote to you right now, and I don't think there'd be a point of me explaining what they are as of now. So once we move on to the demo, where I'll be teaching you how you can create the web framework, we can better understand how this design pattern works. And with that, we are finally ready to move into actually creating our website. So there are certain prerequisites to Django. To perform these, open your command prompt. So the first thing we need to ensure is that your system has Python installed. Now, of course, if you are learning Django, you probably already know Python. And for this purpose, you would have had Python installed previously itself. We'll just check. So type in Python. Python version and if you do have Python installed your version number will appear here now the other thing we need installed is pip so once again pip would also be installed on your systems it comes with Python itself and so yeah I have pip 19.0.2 version now once those two things are done we'll move on to a virtual environment so a virtual environment is basically this environment that we create to isolate our application now this is necessary in Django because often we make applications applications we have completely built the application and now we do not want to touch them we do not want to create anything new we do not want to update any packages that are already being used so if you're creating a new application for which you need to update the packages we don't want the implementation of that to hamper with the implementation of our current application so this is why we completely isolate them so for that the first thing you do is you need to install the virtual environment wrapper we'll use the pip command to do so so pip install virtual env wrapper so if you're using any other system such as linux systems and then press enter but in case of windows put a dash and win which signifies windows so i already have my virtual environment installed so now we have python we have our pip and we have the virtual environment now let's create a virtual environment so to create the virtual environment type in mk virtual env and the name for your virtual environment so previously i had made a virtual environment py1 this time i'll go with py2 and that should create your environment so a virtual environment is created which is py2 and as soon as it's created you'll notice that now your commands start running in py2 so when you're creating an application the application itself is not created at this place it's just the environment files that's stored in here so now all this is done the final prerequisite is of course to have our web framework we need to install Django so let's get to that pip install Django so now that Django is installed we are finally ready to start our project so the command to run to start your first project Django dash admin start project and followed by the name of your project so I'll just name my project the Django project so I just cleared my screen. Now, if you go to this location where we created our project, you'll see the project folder is created here. And inside the folder, there's yet another folder with the same project name and a manage 
file. Now this manage file is usually what we will be running to compile our programs and then within the folder you have certain Python files. So we'll open all this in our IDE and I'll be using PyCharm but you can go ahead with any other Python ID. In fact you can even use a notebook. So you can select your project from here the panel on the left or you can opt for open browse through your folders and then select your project. So the project we created just now is the Django project which is this one. So I'll open it and and your project will appear on the left side panel here. You can see within it there's another folder with the same project name and there's the manage.py file. Now within this folder again there's another folder dot idea and then there is the init settings URL and the WSGI file. Although we won't be making changes or modifying any of these files. So we'll check out what these files are one by one although we won't be making modifications to most of them the idea folder probably won't be existing in your project you can completely ignore that now we'll have a look at what each of these Python files do. So the first file, which is the init file, as you can see, it's empty. The reason is that the very presence of this file is only to inform that this package here, this is not any ordinary folder, it's a Python package. So you don't really need any content within this. Now the next file that we have here is the settings file. So the settings file is the central configuration file. This is modified only when your application goes into the real world. Other than that, we just leave it as it is. So some of the values that you would be modifying is for example the debug value. Now when the debug value is true which in our case it is whenever an error occurs in any of your code and you're trying to run that page all the errors appear on the page. But now if you are putting your website into the real world you do not want that all your errors will be displayed on the page for obviously security reasons. So then you can just change this value to false just before you upload your page. Next you have the URLs page. As from the name, it's very clear. The URLs page is where you have your URL stored. So basically, this file maps the URL of a page to the function that the page will be performing. So now you have the wsgi.py code file. So this page contains an application callable which the application server uses to communicate with your code. And finally, we have the manage.py page. This is the page used to interact with your project. So we never ever touch the manage.py page. The settings page page does change when your website goes into the real world. The URLs page we will be actually modifying during the course of our project. Again the wsgy.py page we leave it untouched. So now that you know the basics of what each file already present does, we can start our demo. So before we start coding our website, there's a dummy development server which is provided with Django. So we'll just check that out first. Just go to your command prompt and move into the path of your project. And then you just type python manage.py run server. And as you can see here, the development server has started and it's at port 8000. So go to your browser, open any browser of your choice, localhost and at 8000 port and as you can see here since we have installed our Django and we ran our server so our Django page has appeared here and it says that our installation worked successful. So so far all good we can now start building our project. So what website are we creating? Well I was thinking of a very basic website where you'll have the front page. The first page would have probably like three four genres and within each genre you'll have a piece that is an an article, a novel or even a poem of that particular genre. So the user gets to click the genre on the first page and the minute he or she does so, we move on to the next page where we have our article within that genre displayed. We'll also include a registration page just to see how that works with Django. So before we move on guys, I want to tell you that this tutorial will completely concentrate on how Django works. So we will not look much into the details of how our page is displayed. That is, we won't go in depth into HTML, CSS and so on, but rather just stick to Django and its functionality. And another thing that we need to know about Django before we start developing is that every page 
reach in Django is called an app. So when you go to a website, say Facebook for instance, you have multiple tabs, right? So there's a tab for the profile. You click on it and it immediately takes you to your profile. Now, if this entire thing that is Facebook was built on Django, then your profile would be one app. And then there's another tab which takes you to your messages. The page where all your messages are displayed, that would be a second app. So that's how Django works. Every small thing, every component or every page of your website is an app. And you need to ensure that you can describe exactly what an app does in one or two sentences. So a page should not have multiple things happening on it. If a page is for displaying messages, that should be the sole purpose of the page. So yeah, that's the basic of apps and how they are a part of Django. So how do we create this app? Just open your command prompt, move on to the path where your project is stored. Now in here, you'll type in the command to create your first app. So that's Python manage.py start app and then the name for your app. So I'll name my app genre. So basically on my first page, I want all my genres to be displayed and every article is put under a particular genre, hence the name. Enter and your app should be created. So I go back to my PyCharm and as you can see here, we have our app genre created in here. Now under this app, there are more number of files. So what do these files do? We'll discuss that first. Well, first is our migrations folder. Now inside this migration folder, there'll be a number of files which will be created. Once we go through our project, we'll see every time we execute a particular command, a new file is inserted into the migrations folder. So this basically connects your database with your source code. And that might seem very complicated, but actually Django makes it extremely easy. And then you have the admin page. Now this admin file or this admin page that Django provides is extremely useful. So it's like this dummy admin page where you can actually go and you can view your entire database there in a very formatted way. You have all the models that you created there. You can insert more values. You can delete values. You can edit values which are already present. So right now the admin page will not be existing. There's no point of us going and checking it right now since we have not created any models yet. Again, what is models? I'll come to that too. So that is the next file I'll be telling you about. Now, if you have gone through object-oriented programming, Python or Java or any other object-oriented programming, as a matter of fact, you probably know the concept of classes. Now, over here in our models file, we create classes and each of this class is actually a model. And by that, we mean it's a database. So when we create a class, we have a number of attributes in this class and each of this attribute forms a column in our database. So that is what will be happening here. And once we create our class or what we call model, that is when we can actually view the admin page. And we'll see how this page is extremely helpful. The next important page is the views page. So guys, if you remember, initially I told you that Django has a design pattern, which is the model view template where model is already discussed. They are the classes. Template, as you probably guessed, is the look of the page. So that's basically a HTML files. And what brings the model and the template together? That is the view. So view adds the function. Now, whenever you receive a request from the user for a particular URL, Vue will describe the response for this request. But Vue is not responsible for giving the response. That is another file that we'll be creating, as you'll see in some time. So now when I go back to my web page here, there's no URL for this. This is just a domain name. But once we start creating our website, the very existence of each web page is linked to a presence of a URL. So that is exactly where we'll start start building. Under our Django project folder, we have this URLs page. There's already a URL path present here. It says admin, which is as you guessed, it's the URL to the admin page that is by default provided by Django. And over here, there's this another parameter. So what this parameter is, it's the response that is to be given for the request that you receive. Now, just in this manner, we need to add the URL for our first page, which is going to be the genres page. So I say path genres 
and then in here i'll insert the action so i've not created any action yet so i don't know what to put in there either as of now but guys think about this so if our website has 10 pages does this mean that we'll have 10 different urls going in here that would be quite half a sad wouldn't it so we need a more organized way of doing this and for that very purpose we will use genres the app as our base app so if from genres we are moving on to our second page so say our genres has our three genres which is fiction inspiration and something else so the user clicks on fiction and this immediately takes the user to the second page where the content in fiction is displayed so then our second page should be a sub page of genre in a way and every other page that we move to from our first page should be the same so for this purpose what we can do is we'll go to our genres app the package we'll create another urls file within genre and in this urls file we'll define the url for our second page with reference to our genres url so how is that done well the first thing you need to do is you must copy paste this statement here into our urls page for this page we do not really need to import include so i'll remove that part out and i also need to define my urls pattern so copy paste this too but again admin is already defined there completely we do not require that now here we'll say if the user wants the page genres this is going to be my first page that is my front page so what will be the response to this the response will obviously be defined in our views page right now we have not created anything in our views page but we will soon and we will name the response for the url genres as index since that is usually what the purpose of the front page is it's usually to display the index so we'll have view dot index and then following this we'll also give a name to this very particular call and the purpose of that i will explain later just name this index for now it's not view it's views and also we need to now import views okay so we define that if the user goes to this page genre then we will be displaying whatever is defined under views.index. Of course, we have not created that yet and we'll move on to that in a while. Now, the problem is every request that is made by the user, the first thing Django does is it checks the URLs page under your main project, which is this page. And under this page, we have not defined the action for genres. And it would be very repetitive to define this again. So what we do instead is we'll just include the file where we did define the function for genres. And that is genres.urls. So the user gives a request for the genres page. Django checks out this main URL page. It sees it matches the URL to this very particular pattern here. And for that, it knows that the response is to include the genres.url page. So it includes this page. And within this page, we of course have the function or the response defined. So now the next thing is to create the response. So now under this views file, we'll create a view. The first thing is we need to import the H HTTP package. The request is always HTTP and this time the response that we are providing is also a HTTP response. We'll change this later because we'll need a more defined response but for now we'll stick to a very basic display on our first web page. So let's import django.http import HTTP response and now we can define our function which will tell what response to provide for the particular URLs. Now here we say that if the user gives a request for this url our response is views.index so within views we need to define a function named index so def index and this one takes request as a parameter and returns a http response and that response could be a simple text of course you can also have html tags and just for the purpose of formatting so that our text looks pretty bold i'll put this into a header just say hello world so that's done this is the response that we'll be providing for that particular url now the thing is we have this page here settings and in settings if you scroll down you'll see there's a list of apps which are installed and in this list our app genre is not mentioned so before we run our server we'll add our app to this list so that's done now go to your web page if getting your learning started is half the battle what if you could do that for free Visit Skillup by Simply Learn. Click on the link in the description to know more. 
the one where you ran your local host first and this time okay so my server is not running i need to start my server first type in your command python manage dot py run server and it says that there's no issue and our server is currently running so you go back to the page where we ran our local host so the last time we ran our local host currently your page would still be on that if you have not done any modifications i did a few in between hence i got this page now if you check out local host again you'll see that there's an error this is because now we started defining the urls in our url page so when you don't give any url as such Django checks out the two URLs defined here and says, hey, what you typed in here, whatever your request was, does not match any of the URL patterns. So now we want to check out the genres page and enter. And as you see here, hello world is displayed. So of course, this is a dummy page. We need to do something way more. We need to create a web page and that is what we'll get to. Okay, so now that we viewed our dummy web page, the next thing we need to do is actually populate this app with some data. Now to populate the app with data, of course, we need to first store the data and that is stored in a database. So with Django, you would have probably already noticed here, there's this file called SQLite3. So this is the database management system that comes along with Django. It's already set up to be used. Just a small command, a small tweak that we require and everything will work perfectly fine. So what this does is basically all the data that you enter through your model will work along with this. So that means that there should be a communication between your SQLite and your source code. Now, if I go back to the terminal where I ran my server, you'll see here there's an error line which says you have 15 unapplied migrations and your project may not work properly. Right now, what we designed worked right because we didn't have any data stored. But from now on, we will be storing data. So we need to ensure that the migrations are done right. And by migrations, we mean that our database management, that's SQLite, is synced pretty well with our source code. So first of all, stop your server. And now you run a command to do the syncing, which is python manage.py migrate. And as you hit this command, the syncing is happening. So when you say that the migrations are complete, what you actually mean is when Django looks at your installed apps, this is an app that we created and we just added it a while back to this list of installed apps. But everything else in here in this list was already present. So these are some default apps with Django or this project in particular will already work with. And many of these apps require to access some databases. It could not do that until now. But now that we finished our migrations, when Django checks out these apps and needs to run them, it can easily access the database, take whatever data is required from there and perform its functions. Again, if we go back to our command prompt and run the server again, you'll see that this time we do not get the error of the unapplied migrations. So that is how you sync your database with your source code. Now, once we create our models, it means that we have added some new classes. There are some new tables which are going to be added. So again, we need to perform the migration function, which we'll look into later. Now let's get to creating our classes. So as I mentioned earlier, models are basically classes. Now there are two classes that we will be creating for this particular project. The first class will have all the genres and the second class which will hold all the articles. So let's begin coding. Now my first class, I'll call it collection. And every class needs to import from models.model. Now within this class, all we need to define are its various attributes. So I'll explain this again. The class is basically a table and all your attributes of the particular class are the columns. So the first thing is the collection name or the genre name. Now the collection name would be something like a fiction or inspiration or non-fiction could be anything and all these are strings so when you're inputting them so in django basically that's the char field type so you say models dot char field and a compulsory parameter here is you have to insert the maximum length i'll give it 100 characters next thing we'll have a description for each genre type that again would be char field enter a max length 
give it 500 and then we'll also have an image or a cover for each of the collection or each of the genre so that would be i'd say called cover as in collection cover so this again will be a care field type as i'm going to enter the link for the image over here now the links would be pretty large so i'd say a length of thousand so that's our first class now we'll define a second class which is for the particular articles or the pieces which are inside the collection. So here we'll just go for one article within a collection and I'll name this class as piece, as in a piece within a collection. Again, this class to imposed from models.model and we will enter the column names now. So every piece will have a title which would be the name of the piece and that too would be of care field type. Give this a 200. And then all of these will have a particular type. That is whether it's a book, it's a novel, it's a poem or it's a blog post. That is what will go in our type variable. Next we'll have the artist name for a book that would be an author. For a poem that would be a poet. So we'll go for the general term which is artist. The year it was published. Now the year would be an integer. So we have a different field type here. The integer field. And that does not require a max link. And finally again for each piece you'll have a cover. So I'll name that piece cover. Again we'll pass the link of an image here. So care field with the max length of thousand and yeah so our two models are created here class collection and class piece now once again we'll do the migration and what will happen is that the database will link with this model and then we can finally view the admin page and see what exactly that admin page is that we've been talking about all this while but before we move on we are missing out on something so we have our collection and we have each piece how do we link the piece with the collection well this is where the concepts that you probably learned in database is gonna come into use this is where we'll use a foreign key so although we are writing a code here this is exactly how a table in a database will be created so every item would have a primary key and now we are going to use foreign keys in our class piece to link each piece to a particular collection so if i say dan brown's book origin so that should be linked through the foreign key with our collection fiction so let's create our foreign key and i'll name it collection but this time with a small c models dot foreign key so to the foreign key you pass the table name to which you're making the reference first which is collection and then you pass on an action as to what will happen to a particular piece if the collection that it's linked to is deleted so what we want is if suppose fiction is deleted then automatically origin which is tied with fiction should also be deleted and that is called a cascade delete so you say on delete models dot cascade and now we are finally done creating our models so now that our models are created we know these particular models are created for our application or our app genre so you go back to the settings page and here we had previously inserted this app genre but back then it was not really required it was just that there is this other app that is not included in the default apps given by Django. So let's put in the name there. But now that we actually have a database associated with this app, we need to specify this app in its complete structure. That is the configuration. So if you go under genres and then there's this file apps and under apps, you can see this class genre config. Copy this, go back to settings. So genre dot apps dot genre config. So now when you run your server, Django will check the list of installed apps and will be able to access the database associated with our newly created app too. But there's more to it than that. Remember how previously we made migrations so we can link our database with the source code. Now we got to make those migrations again because now we created new models. So every time you create a model or you make some changes to your models, you always need to do your migrations and this time since our migrations is specific to a particular app the syntax is slightly different so you can also use this terminal down here it works just the same and 
python manage.py make migrations and your app name enter and as you see it says the models collection and piece have been created now what this migrations exactly does is it converts these models that you have written in coded format into an sql form so that's where your tables and everything stored and now if you check your migrations folder you'll see there's a new file under it that is a current migration that you attempted so now that the migrations are made you can finally run your project so once again an overall migrations so i'm back to my command prompt since the black background makes it easier to see the text break out of your server and we finished our migration so now we can run our server no issues and there's no error with the migrations either let's now check out our genre page of course it'll look the same because although we created our models what the models will be reflected in is the database the overall look of the page so far has not been changed so it's the same so i'll repeat that once again every time you make a change to your model or you add some new class to your model first run the migrations for that particular app that is python manage.py make migrations and your app name and then you run a migrations in general so that's python manage.py migrations and then you can run your server okay so our database is created but right now it's empty so our next step is to populate our database for that again open a command prompt and now you need to enter into the sql shell so the command for that is python manage.py shell but before that i'll just go to the path where my project is stored and now in here i'll execute my command so once you get these three arrows you know that you have entered the shell and over here you can execute your sql commands now before we input values into our tables what we need to do is we have to import these tables because even within this project there are multiple number of tables there are some tables which were in there by default too so from genre dot models import collection come up piece which are the name of our tables and enter so our tables are now imported now first we'll populate our table collection okay so collection has three columns there's the collection name there's a description and there's a cover image so go back to your shell so we'll have an object here collection 1 which will be equal to collection so this would be the constructor for our class collection and within this we'll insert our values so our first attribute is collection name and that's equal to fiction our second attribute is the description and we'll say enter the world of fantasies for the description of fiction and finally we have the attribute called cover which is the collection cover and in here i'll just enter the url of an image i found online So that's it we have entered the values for our three attributes now press enter now let's view if this actually stored in our database so for that you execute the command your table name which is collection dot objects dot all and it's empty so what's wrong we created an object in which we inserted all the values but then still our database seems to be empty so this is because so far this collection object that we created is only stored in our shells memory we have not actually committed this to the database so the command for committing this to the database would be our object name which is call one dot save and once again we'll execute the command to check everything that's present in our database collection and now you can see finally that there is an object present and now we can also check the value of the various columns in our table collection for this particular object you can say call one dot collection name and gives you the collection name similarly you can also check its description now as i mentioned previously every object that you create in a table has a primary key associated with it so the primary key basically holds the uniqueness of that particular row so we can also check the primary key for a particular row or an object just go for call one dot pk and it says the primary key is 1 now the primary key is also known as the id of the object so you can identify it as id2 again you'll get the value which is 1 now if you want to change the value of any of these columns that can also be done very easily on the shell so suppose i want to change the description say call1 dot description 
and initially it was enter the world of fantasies i wanted to be welcome to the world of fantasies so welcome to the world of fantasies and now if i check the value of call one dot description the value has changed so that's pretty simple isn't it now if you think this is simple there's a much much more simpler way of adding values to the database which we'll see just in a while and that is where we'll put in more objects we'll have a few more genres and we'll also add elements to our table piece so now we can look into how to create our admin page so now that we learned how to input or populate our database through the shell let's go for the easier and the more efficient way which is through the admin now before we do that we need to create an admin and for that go to your command prompt out of the shell now in your command prompt type the command python manage.py create super user okay so once you do that they'll ask you to create a username and we'll just go for admin since we are creating ourselves as the admin enter enter an email id just go with admin123 at admin.com and a password so since this is not a production environment i'm gonna just bypass the password validation but if your website is going into the real world then make sure things are secure enough and our super user is created successfully so now we can go on to a browser and here we'll just type admin so this is our admin page you can see here there are two tabs groups and users but the main thing the main reason that we require the admin page does not seem to come out here we expected there to be our database tables present here so we can directly go and edit them or add some values to them but it's not there so what is missing is that we need to go back to our python page and over here go down to the admin file so here we need to add the models that we want to appear in the admin page basically we need to register those models with the admin page and for that the first thing we do is we have to import the model so from dot models import and our two classes are collection and piece so we have not added anything to our table piece yet we will later on but any how we'll just register both of them at one shot and you type in here admin dot site dot register collection copy paste this and change the collection to piece which is our second table and that's it so with just these two lines of code you should have your collection and your piece tables appearing in the admin page now when i move back to the admin page and refresh this you'll see that our tables have appeared here click on collection and there's one collection object here click on that you can see the values of the attributes and through this admin page now i'll show you how you can add more objects so just press on save and add another here we can enter our second collections name which in my case is inspiration and description would be be inspired to do more and for call cover which is the collection cover i have another link that i just took from the net save and we'll add one more so we'll have three collections now and our third collection would be horror the description let's say the fear is real although we hope it's not and finally we have the collection cover paste the link here save this too so now we have three objects under collection now as you see here all our collection objects just say collection object with a number in bracket in the similar manner when we were also going through our shell every time we executed the command collection dot objects dot all we got just the name collection object and a number but we want something more meaningful so when i look at this table of collections i know that the first one is the collection fiction the second one is the collection inspiration and so on so for that go back to your code so go under your models.py file and under the class collection we'll define a special method which is double underscore str now this is an overriding method that is this method already defined but the value returned by this method is not of much meaning to us as of now so now over here we'll return something that we actually want to see when we look at the objects in our table collection and what i want is i want the collection name to appear 
that would be quite clear as to what object is at which position. So I say collection return self dot collection name and that should do it. Now in the similar manner we can have the same function for piece 2 and for piece what we want to return is the title. So that's it. Now if I go back to my admin page refresh this. As you can see, we have something much more meaningful under our table collection now. The objects actually have a name. Well, the objects don't actually have a name, but we are displaying one of the attributes of the object and that gives more clarity as to what the object holds. So now we'll start creating our views. Now, as I mentioned earlier, our website would be such that the first page that the user goes to is probably going to be the genres page, which will have the URL genre slash and with nothing following it. So the function for that particular URL or the response for that particular URL we defined in here in our URLs page under the genres app which is we'll be calling the index function in views. That is this function. Now from that page there will be certain links and when the user clicks those links he or she can move to another web page and that is the web page where the particular article present inside our collection would be displayed. So I'll just put down in comment what pattern of the URL we are matching for each of these parts. So the first one that we are matching is just genre followed by nothing. Now our next path would be genre followed by a number. Now this number one here is actually the ID of the collection that the user chooses. So if the user chooses the collection fiction, which is our first collection, that has a primary key one. So immediately the user should be sent to the next web page, which is genre slash one, where one represents the ID of the collection chosen by the user. So now for path, let's pass the expression that will match this particular URL. And that expression's actually just an integer number since the front part that is genre slash is already matched. And this integer number, we are going to store it in a variable because we'll require that variable later. So you can just say int colon and collection ID. Now when you do this and genres ID. So when you do this, what happens is that this one gets stored in this variable genre ID and this pattern will match this URL. Now when this URL is matched, what response do you want to give? That is what do you want to display on that particular web page? That will be defined in another function. We'll define under views. We'll name it details for now. Of course, details is not defined. We'll do that in a while and give a name to this too which will be the same details. So now we are able to recognize this URL. What we need to do is next, we need to define details, which will give a response to that URL. So go to your views page and you create your details function. Now what is displayed in this details function greatly depends upon the genre that is chosen by the user in the first page, which is stored again in genres ID. So over here, you pass not only the request, but also genre ID. And inside, you'll return a HTTP response. The collection, the genre ID is the HTML tags also need to be within the quotes. Copy paste that in here. Have quotes here too. And now one more thing we need to do is so genre's ID is an integer but we cannot concatenate an integer with a string. So we need to convert this to a string and that's it. So let's go back to our web page and run this page. So the first page, which is genres displays hello world. Now, if I enter genres slash one, which is what we created newly, run the code, you see here the genre ID is one. In a similar manner, even if I enter five, although we don't have a collection five, it'll display the genre ID is five. Now, these are dummy web pages, so this kind of a display is fine. Of course, once we actually start building our view, which we will do very soon, things will be more defined. Now, let's get to actually creating a good view. So what we want here is uh, first of all, we do not want to display any large text. So let's delete that off. We need to import our models because this is where our database is. And of course, we need to fetch information from our database to be displayed on our view. So from dot models, import collection and 
piece now in our index function what we'll do is we'll first collect all the objects from our table collection we'll have a variable which is all collection and then to collect all the objects we'll use the same sql command that we used so so that's collection dot objects so all your objects in the collection table will be stored in all collection now we'll store this as a dictionary so that we can iterate over these objects and display them one by one so we say context equal to all collection is the key and the value would be our variable all collection so that's done now we need to iterate over this so do we do that within our views itself but there's no point of doing that because while we are iterating over every object in our collection table, we also need to display them in a certain format. That means that we need these objects to be somehow embedded in a HTML file. And this is where we create our very first HTML file for our first page, which is the genres page. So to create our HTML page inside genre, create another package and you name this package templates now inside templates create another folder and give this package the name same name as your app name that is genre and now inside genre we can create a html file i'll name this file genre template so all our template or our html files will be in this path okay so before we actually develop the genre template html file we'll go back to our view and complete the section off. So now what we are saying is that we have a template, we have a HTML file, and that file will define how we need to display the objects in our collection database or our collection table. All we need to do here in our index function is actually pass these objects to our HTML file. So for this, we have a function render, and before we actually use the function, we need to import the library django.shortcuts under which we have this function render. This is already imported on top. I did not see that, so I'll just remove that part out. And now that you have the render function, you use that to pass your object. So what this render function does is basically we'll pass context to it. It will type context with the template name that we pass and it will return a HTTP response object. So you pass your request, you pass the path to your template that is genre slash templates slash genre slash genre template dot html so now you have passed your template to and finally the object which is context so that's pretty much all you need to do for your very first view under the views file now we need to develop our genres template so for our html file first thing we'll change the title let's display our app name so in this particular case since i'm making a dummy website i'm not giving it a name or anything just going with our app name Okay, so now we need to display our objects which have been passed from the views folder. Now the render function basically passes an object which is called object underscore list. So we'll create a for loop, say collection in object underscore list. So this way we can iterate through all the objects in our object list and now see this is an html file but this line of code here this is the python code so pretty often this will happen that you need to embed a python code within your html file so what you do is you insert your python code within curly brace followed by the percentage sign this will tell your compiler that hey although this is a html file this line here is actually a python instruction so now we're able to extract each genre in fact, I'll name this variable as genre obj. Now we need to decide how exactly we want to display these objects. So what I want is first I want the image of that particular collection or the genre to be displayed, which is what I've stored in one of the variables. And then just below the image, I want the name of the genre to be displayed. Now this name should be clickable so that the minute the user clicks on it, we can move on to another page. And then just below the name, I want the description for that genre to be displayed. Okay, so first we have the image, img source. And in here, I need to insert the link for that particular image. 
So the link I actually already stored in my database as I showed we did that through the shell and then later on through the admin page too. So how do we access that particular link? Well, just like you would in a Python code, you can access it through the variable name and every time you're accessing or you're displaying just the value of a variable, you insert the variable name within double braces. So double braces and then genre obj dot call cover. And now I'll give it some height and width to make it look a little more appealing. We'll have minimal formatting here because the objective of this tutorial is not to show you how to write your HTML code, but how Django works. And next I'll have the name. As I said, this particular name would be clickable. So inside href, I will insert the URL of the page the user should be taken to once he clicks on the name. So that URL is what we defined here. Okay, so it's genre followed by the primary key or the ID of the category that he clicked. So that would be genre slash and we stored it in genre ID. So that's the link the user will be taken to. And now the name that will be displayed. And then after that, finally, we have the description to be displayed. So that will be in a h3 header again double braces because we are going to just print out the value of a variable and then after each object's details are displayed we'll break a line for better formatting what i'll do is i'll have all of this embedded within a div and have it aligned to the center so that's it we have created our html file here one more thing i'll just say end for so that's it, our HTML file or our complete display for the first page has been created. So once again, I'll explain what will happen in the case of our first page only. When the user enters the URL slash genre followed by nothing, Django will first check this URL's page, the main URL page. It'll see the path has matched here and the action for this has been defined as you include the genres.url page. So it goes to the genres.url page, includes this, and in this, there's a function defined as a response for this particular URL, a very well-defined function, which is in our views file. So it goes to the views file, and in the views file, we have completely defined our function index. Over here, we collect all the objects in our collection table. We convert that into a dictionary so that it's iterable. Then we pass it using the render function. So the render function will take your template and it will tie that along with the context, which is the dictionary. And it will pass an object, a response object to our HTML file. This response object will be called object.list and it is iterable. So we'll iterate through the object. We will display each object in a sort of formatted way. And that is it. And then the render function will pass this object all collection to our template. And over here, we will iterate over the all collection, which is the dictionary. And using this HTML code here, we'll print out the objects in all collection in a formatted way. So that's it. And one more thing, make a small correction back in the views file. So initially I had inserted the entire path to genre template.html. So the thing with the render function is that it automatically knows that it must look into the templates folder. So you have to only give the path after the template that's genre slash genre template. Now let's go back to our browser and in here put in your URL. And there you go. So that's our first web page. You can see the image for our genre is here. And then you have the name and then you have the description. Okay, so that's redirecting us to a page where there's an error. It says that this path is not found. So when you look at these error guys, you will understand better as to how the matching of the URL patterns take place. First, this URL pattern, just this part after your port number that is checked against the URL in your main URL file that is Django projects.url file where we have defined just genre and then after that it will check the files that we included in the genres URL file that is genre followed by the the genre ID 
Now we had defined a dummy page for this previously and that was being displayed too. So I'll go back to the code and figure out what the error is. The error is here, of course, I wrote genre ID, which does not signify anything as such. Now, because here we have this object genre obj. That is where all the objects from the collection table are stored one by one. So what we actually need to access is the ID for genre obj. Now I'll go back to my browser. So now I'm back to my browser and as you can see here, we still have our front page. Click on fiction and yeah, we got our dummy page back. So now our next step is to design this page. Go back to your code and again, designing the page means we need to start putting content into our details function. Now, before we start designing this function, we need to populate the piece table. So again, let's go back to our admin page. We'll add the data through the admin page since that's much easier. Here you have piece and click on the add button. First, we'll add for fiction. The title will give, let's insert the book origin by Dan Brown. So the artist would be Dan Brown and it's a novel. And the year is 2017. That's the year of publication. And for the piece cover, I'll just put the book origins front page cover. I'll just put in the image here, a link. Save and add another. Now for inspiration, I'll put in the poem if and type would be poem. Artist is Rudyard Kipling. Kipling with single P. The year of publication would be 1895. And for the piece cover, another link. And finally, we'll add one to horror. The title would be The Pet Symmetry, written by Stephen King. And again, this is a novel. It's published in the year 1983. And then link. And we save this. So we are done for each of the categories or each of the genre. We have added a single article. So now that our table piece is also populated, we can start designing the view for this. So for our details page, let's start with removing this HTTP response here. So first what we need to do is we need to extract the object that the user selected from our genres page. So we say collection dot objects dot get pk equal to genre id so what we are doing here is as you can see above we use the query collection dot objects dot all which returned all the objects in our table collection now here we are telling that okay i want just one object from my collections table and that particular object is the one whose primary key matches that stored in the variable genre dot id and since genre dot id is defined in this file and it's basically the ID of the genre that the user selected. This will be a number either one, two or three. That is one for fiction, two for inspiration and three for horror. So now that we got that object, we will use this object C item to extract from a piece table. So for that we say piece dot object dot filter. And to this we pass and the category that we filter on is the collection. And that is our foreign key. So remember when we created our table piece, we had a foreign key named collection. So we are saying if collection is equal to C item, then extract that particular object from our table piece. And then we will return this again through the render method. Pass the request. And in here, we'll have the path to an HTML file, just like we did in the previous case. But this time a different HTML file, because we want to display this slightly differently. And then finally, we need to pass the context. So we haven't created the context yet, which we will. Now, although this is just one item, every time you're passing it through the render function, you need to make a dictionary out of it. So just copy paste this here, name this p item, pass in here p item, 
and just now I did create a HTML file in the same path as before that is under templates you have the genre folder and under that I created a HTML file called detail template nothing's filled yet but now that we have created a file we can put in the path here so just copy paste this and change the genre to detail so that's done too now all we have left is to actually code the HTML file so I'll just copy paste this here and then make the required correction so in p item and this would be piece object you align its center and piece obj is the cover we do not really need a href here so delete that part out because this is the final page we are not redirecting to any other page from here of course when you're building a complete web page this ideally when you click on the name of an article the article should open we wouldn't be including that part here though because it does not bring out any new functionality of Django piece obj and here so piece obj dot title dash and then we'll print out the author or the artist name so piece obj dot artist and finally we can have the year also what this particular article is that is the type so that's pretty much it we'll change the title too so now that this is done we'll just end the for loop also this is not call cover but now we gotta change it to piece cover and now we'll go back to our browser so this is our genre page, refresh it once again and we'll click on one of the genres and yeah as you see the particular piece related to that genre gets displayed. The Pet Symmetry by Stephen King which is a novel published in the year 1983. So now we're back to our code and well our first and our second page is designed, it's working fine. So now we are not going to create something new instead what is already created let's modify that now so far the functions that we wrote work just fine but Django provides this thing called generic classes or generic views what this does is it makes writing these functions extremely easy so now you have four lines of code the exact same thing can be done in like two or three lines of code in fact it's not just the easier method this is also recommended so I'll tell you how that is done first of all we need to import the generic package so from Django dot views import generic and now let's delete this entire thing so our first function is basically listing out all the objects in the table so you have multiple objects all of them are being listed out now this kind of a function would belong to a generic class so far I was defining functions now I'm speaking about class so is it a function or a class well it is a class it's definitely a class but I'll show you how this class is called as a function so first we'll finish writing the class now we have the class index and this particular class type is a list view because we are listing out objects now under this first we'll have a template name which is the path to our template and now to return our query set so previously we were always returning a dictionary now we can return a query set we have a function def query set and under this we just say return collection dot objects dot all so the same query we were using previously but now we do not need to take the objects from the query and then convert them into a dictionary then pass it on using the render function we can simply do this one statement and all our objects will be sent to our template where now in the template so far we were seeing all collection because that is the key that we were using in our dictionary 
but that is no more we are not using the render function anymore when this query set passes an object it's received by the template file in a variable named object list so you replace your previous variable with object list and that is it with that we finished the method for displaying our first page now we'll move on to the second page so the second page is slightly different because this time we are not listing out multiple objects we just have one object and we are basically giving out the details of the object that means that this class which we'll still call details is a detail view class so we say generic dot detail view let's delete all of this first now the function of this detail view is basically to display the details of an object so what we need to do is first we need to define a model now our model is collection because we are receiving the primary key from the collection and each of this object actually is a part of a collection the object would not exist if the related or the counterpart genre of that object did not exist so our model is collection and our template name will be again the path so that genre detail template dot html and that's it so this is even smaller than our generic view now in our detail template initially we had the name of the key in our dictionary again this time we don't have a dictionary pass so what is the value here well the value here would be collection dot piece underscore set dot all so this will return all the pieces related to that particular collection and everything in small this time now we are almost done go back to your views and you see this is a generic detail view now the thing about the detail view class is it always accepts one parameter go back to your urls file as you are passing here a variable gen uh, genre underscore id of in type you don't need to do that anymore you can simply say pk and pk will be passed to this class and now that's the problem so here we were calling functions but now we have classes defined not functions anymore so we need to figure out a way of calling this class as a function so for that you just say as underscore view for both of these classes and that's it as simple as that now you can call your classes as a function and since you use the generic view now things have become so much more simpler much smaller our code looks very neat now let's go back to our browser go to our front page let's see if everything's displayed right yes it is so our changes worked out just fine click on one of these tags and as you can see the page has loaded so much less code very few lines of code but things work just as fine as before so our web page is all built but let's add something new over here to make it look a little more like a website one of the most common things that you find in every website you go to is a navigation bar so let's add the navigation bar go back to your code now in here we need a navigation bar in both our pages so typically what you might think is the way to go about it is add the code for navigation bar in your genre template and detail template but as you know whenever you code repeatability is something that you should be always against minimum repeatability so instead what we do is under genre the same folder that has all our templates create another html file and name this base so this will be our base template and we will add the code for creating a navigation bar in here and then we'll just include this base in our other templates so first let's create our navigation bar now we'll be using bootstrap to create the navigation bar and every time you work with bootstrap the first thing you need to do is in your head section include these three links so if you have worked with bootstrap you probably already know you need to go to the bootstrap website copy these links paste them here so you're basically able to access some style sheets which are stored in some other system 
and once that's done you can start building your navigation bar so in your body you have nav class nav bar and nav bar default so this is the class for creating your basic navigation bar but actually we'll go with inverse instead of default so this has a dark theme navigation bar it will look better on our white background website within this create a div tag of container fluid so basically what the container fluid does is that your navigation bar will occupy the entire page and will fit according to the page width now under this you have the navbar brand class and the first icon i want is my home okay so i put in home here and when i click on home whatever i want to be redirected to whichever page i want to be redirected to put the link for that or the url for that in here and i'd like to be redirected to the genres page since that's our home page now other elements we can include in our navigation bar we put them as list elements so class nav nav bar and we want these elements to the right of our navigation bar so we say nav bar right now i'm not going into the details of this since again this is not a part of the django tutorial so we'll quickly just create the navigation bar now every element to the right will be listed out and i'll have a registration button so that will be under genre slash register now i have not created the view for this url yet in fact this url is not even identifiable yet but for now i'll just put that in and we'll run it all together and finally at the very right end corner of my navigation bar i want to display the username that is whichever user is currently going through my website now yeah right now we have not designed the features for all of this we don't have a registration form itself so a user does not mean anything to us right now but very soon i'll show you how you can create a registration form you can have users register to it so then this will start making sense so we'll say li class and in here the way you can extract the current user of your website is you say request dot user and that's it that's pretty much all we need right now just check all the tags again we have the nav bar inverse which is the type the look of our navigation bar it's container fluid and here we actually need to specify that it's a header so we say in div class nav bar header well this would be closing right in the end so i'll just format this once and finally down here you insert two python statements you say block content uh content is a variable so you can have any other name here just say block content and then end block so why this i'll explain to you in a while so basically this entire part creates your navigation bar but you require this navigation bar to be present in multiple pages so here when you say block content and end block it's basically the content that will fall in each of the pages so if i go to my genre template page i can simply include the base template here and then everything inside the genre template page all this instruction to actually create that page will come under a block so what we'll do here is we'll go to our template pages and here we will extend our base.html file so extends 
genre/base.html and then the body the instructions within the body will be the content of the block so you say block content and then end block now we do the exact same thing with our detail template So now this way we created a common base file for our navigation bar and the content for each of these templates will be by turn included within this tag here. So we'll have the navigation bar present for every page. Now when we move back to our browser, you see the change here. There is a navigation bar. If you click on home, we'll be redirected to our genre page and then click on one of the categories and you have been redirected to the next page the navigation bar is still present so we also have a user here currently the only user we created the super user it's the admin this will change soon once we start registering people so next step is to create a form where we can actually have users register so for a registration page the first thing we need to do is we need to create a url and go in here let's copy this line so the recognizable url would just say register so it would be genres slash register and that would call a views function called user form and we obviously haven't defined this class yet. So yeah, this is also going to be a class. We are going to use the generic view to create this too. It's going to be pretty simple. But since it's a class, we need to call it as a function. So as view will still exist. And we here we'll have user form. But before we start actually creating a view for the registration page or writing our HTML file, we need to create a blueprint for the form. So why a blueprint for the form when we did not create a blueprint for our other pages? I'll tell you why, but first we need to comment this particular line because it will result in an error. And now we'll check out our admin page. Yeah, so this table here is what we'll be using to store our usernames so the tables already present here we'll just tweak it a little that is we'll take the username we'll take the email address and we'll take a password field all of these actually have a password if you click on them you can see here the password is hashed so these are the three fields that we'll collect from the user so we'll use the basic form just selecting exactly what we need so for that purpose we need to create the blueprint so to create the blueprint under genre create a python file calling it forms and now in here we'll import that table we just saw that database so we say django dot contrib dot auth dot models import user that two imports here so and then we'll import the module forms. Okay, so now we can create a class called user form, which will import from forms dot model form. And in here we'll have a class called meta. So meta basically means the definition or a description of your class. So inside our class user form, we'll have a description for our class. And in that description, we give a model name. So our model name is user because we'll be using that particular model I just showed you. And then we'll specify the fields that we'll be using from this model because we are not taking all the fields. We are going to ignore a few of them. So we say fields, create a list here. And within the list, we'll enter the name of the attributes that we'll be actually using for our particular form. So we have username, email, and we'll take a password. Now, unlike username and email, password is not just any care field. So over here, we have to specify the password type. So you say forms.carefield. And within brackets, 
you say widget equal to forms dot password import so password input so from this your Django will know that here we basically need to take the hashed values and not just store what the user inputs as characters. So that's it. With that, we have created the blueprint of our form. Next thing is we can actually go to the views and begin writing the view, the class view for our form. So the class to create a form, we call user form view. Actually, before we proceed, we need to import this. So let's do that first. Import user form. Also need to import some other packages. Here we'll import a few packages for user authorization. That's authenticate and login. And now we can begin writing our user form view class. So to user form view, you pass the object view. And we also need to import a class for this. So let's do that. From Django dot views dot generic import view. Okay, so the first thing we need to define a class for this form. And that would be the user form. And once again, a template for this form, which will define the outlook this form has. So you give a template name, which is a variable name. Actually, you can have any variable name here, just something that makes sense. Now, I don't have a template page already. So I've not, as in I've not created another HTML file for the form specifically, but I know that I'll be creating it, the parse genre slash and the name of the HTML file. So that would be form template. Now, the minute we are done writing this view, I'll show you how we do the template. That's just basic HTML code. So I'm pretty sure you know how to work with that too. Now with forms, there are two things. There's the get method. That is basically when the user wants a form. So you give the user an empty form. And there's a post method. That is when the user puts in his or her details into the form. So with our class, with our generic classes, these methods are already defined. And within two, three lines, you can completely define the functionality of these. So first is the get method to which we pass self and request. Now the first thing is you provide the form to the user and this form is empty. So you say self dot form class and you pass nothing to this because as I mentioned earlier too, the form is empty. And now what you do is you return this object through the render function. So basically when you do this, the form is combined with the HTML file and an object is returned. So basically when you do this, what happens is, as I mentioned earlier too, the render function works in the same way. It passes the object of the form, the content of the form to the template and it basically sends out a HTTP request. So that's your template name. And then finally the form itself. And as we did previously, this will be a dictionary. And that is the get function. Now we'll move on to the post. Again, you pass self and request. Now when the user enters the data and then hits the submit button, that's when the post function will be called. All the data will be stored in a particular data variable. And that is what we'll be defining in the first line. So form equal to self dot form class and request dot post. So all your data will go into this post variable. Now the next thing that the post function has to do is check if the data entered by the user does make sense. So for that you say if form dot is valid. 
So if the form is valid, save this data. So you say form.save. So where exactly are we saving this? Well, as I showed you previously, uh, Django provides this table for user, this database for storing the users and the group users. So that is exactly where we'll be storing the data received through this particular form. Now, if the data is valid, we can separate out the various fields, receive their cleaned format. So first we have our username. Say username equal to form dot cleaned data and that will be username and then you have the password. So remember when the user entered the data itself it was stored in these fields but now we are getting a cleaned version of that data and storing it in this these variables username and password and now Unlike how we can usually put the equal to sign and assign values to certain variables, this kind of a process is not possible for passwords because passwords are not just storing some char field data. It has a hash value. I'll show you that once again. So you see here, you go to the users, admin, and if you check this out, the password is not actually stored as just characters. It's hashed using some algorithm and then it's stored. So in this particular case, we cannot say that password is equal to this value. There's a certain function through which you pass the password such that it's stored in the required format. So for that you say user dot set password and then you pass password variable. And finally you say user dot save. So guys over here actually we are saving the data in the shell not in your database and once our data is cleaned and everything it is then that we are saving it into the database so that's why we have two save statements here so now that the user has entered their data and they have hit the submit button we have saved the data in our database what's next well now what we want to do is we need to redirect the user to the index page basically once the user is done with the registration process there's no point of the user staying on the same page again. So we redirect them to the index page. Now along with this, we'll also combine login. So if the user's password and username are authenticated and the user is in active status, that means that the user has logged into our website. So now we'll see how this is done. Create a object new user and this object will hold a user if the username and the password that we pass here to this authenticate function is actually valid and they match that is the form of that is the form of pair so the username will be the variable username and password will be the variable password so if the new user does exist that is if new user is not null If the new user is not none, we'll check the status of the new user. So what is the status? Again, I'll take you back to that database. Go to users. Well, since we're in the middle of the code, we cannot access this page. But basically this database or this table which stores the usernames has a field called status which you probably would have noticed and next to the active user there's a green tick. So if the user has that green tick, if the user is active, that means his session is in progress. So it's basically like logging in. So you say if new user dot is active. You log in the user, so you send request and the new user object. And once the user has logged in, you return the user to the index page. And this is where you need to use a function redirect. Before we use that function, we need to of course import it. So here, uh, redirect is within this same shortcuts library. We we'll just add in redirect here. So index page is basically called journal. So that's where the user will be taken. Now, if this 
user is not authenticated that is there is some invalid data entered we basically give the user back a form an empty form give them another chance to fill it so for that we just copy paste this line here the render put that down there and that's it with that we are done creating our view for our user form now what we are left with is actually creating this html file so let's do that again go to genre your main folder and create a html file now remember what we named a html file in this view that's form template make sure it's the same name so let's start creating the form. The first thing we do is for the form too, we want to add the navigation bar. So go to your, go to any of your HTML files and copy out these lines here. Registration. Then you have the block content, which is exactly where you'll be putting all your content. That goes here. And then we'll start and then we'll add the end block again copy paste that too okay so now we can start typing out our html code so first is our form tag now this is going to be an extremely simple straightforward form and now the thing with django is whenever you're having a form an interactive form make sure to include this csrf token here so csrf stands for cross-site request forgery that can be sent actually from and it's a type of cross-site scripting attack that can be sent from a malicious site through your visitor's browser to your own server so to prevent this django provides a very simple technique which is where you provide this csrf token now make sure you're always providing this whenever you have a post method and you're not redirecting or you're not using the url of or you're not using an external url because that means that your current page's csrf token is being sent to an external web page and obviously that kind of a leakage would hamper the security okay so we'll be taking a username Again, email is also type text. And finally, the password. And after all the fields, you have finally the submit button. And that's it. So our HTML page is also ready now. So now you need to move on to the URLs page and uncomment this because now we actually have a response. Also, this is called user form view now. I'll just stop the server and run it again. Although this is not really necessary, if you just go back to your page, refresh it, everything works fine. Okay, now we will move on to our web page. Okay, so our home page is working fine just like before. Next, you click on register and here's your form. So as you can see here, the navigation bar is present for the form too. Now we'll create a new user named simply with the email ID simply123 at gmail.com and a password. That's it. Now click the submit button. And the minute we click the submit button, as you can see, you got transferred back to the home page. And in here, if you see the right hand corner, you'll notice that we had admin before, but now it's simply. So that is because we just now created a user simply. And the minute you create a user by default, that becomes the active user. Now to check this, we will move on to the admin page. And this is our landing page. So now what happened is that since the other user that we newly created, is the active user that means we got logged out of the admin's profile and to view the admin page of course we need to be logged in as the admin so i log back in and as you can see here under the users group you'll notice we have a new user created 
simply with the following email ID. Choose from over 300 in-demand skills and get access to 1,000 plus hours of video content for free. Visit SkillUp by Simply Learn. Click on the link in the description to know more. Welcome to Web Scraping with Python. My name is Richard Kirshner with the Simply Learn team. That's www.simplylearn.com. Get certified, get ahead. Certainly there are many reasons to be able to go online and scrape different websites. They range everything from pulling out different links uh, to pulling data off of websites. As a data scientist, you might need to get some information off a website that doesn't have a direct API to pull that information. And in Python, we have a wonderful tool. When you talk Python and you talk web scraping, we're talking beautiful suit. Which is a package you add into your Python that you're running. And we can come over here to the website, www.crummy.com slash software slash beautiful soup. You can actually read a little bit about it. Currently, beautiful soup 4 is the current version. If you don't remember the full website for it, you can always do what I do, which is go over and do a search for beautiful soup official site. And it almost always comes up right at the top, and you click on there, and it'll take you to the crummy.com software site for beautiful soup. Now, we're going to use our whatever Python interface you want IDE. I'm going to use Jupyter Lab, which is built on Jupyter Notebook through Anaconda. Uh, Jupyter Lab is Jupyter Notebook with added tabs and some added features. It's basically in beta testing, so it's got a few little glitches when you're saving things and moving between projects, but for the most part it's a great upgrade to the Jupyter Notebook and you can use them together. So you don't have to, I mean it's built on Jupyter Notebook, so anything you do in Jupyter Notebook you can open up in Jupyter Lab. And the first thing we need to do is we need to go ahead, in this case I'm going under my environments since it partitions the environments out and I'm going to open up a terminal window. We have to install some packages in here to work with. Now there's a lot of choices on this. I, because of the simplicity, will be using conda install. Now you can use pip install for the same thing and we're going to install our beautiful soup 4. Uh, and you have to type out the whole thing, beautiful soup 4, and you can use a pip install if you're using a different environment. And I am using Python version 3.6, although according to beautiful soup they also work on 3.7 all the way from 2.7 through all of 3x. Now according to the beautiful soup website the beautiful soup 4 works on anything you can install on anything from Python 2.7 all the way through any of the Python 3 versions. Uh, this just happens to be Python 3.6 because they do there's a lot of other packages that don't work on 3.7 yet. And we'll go ahead and run this install on here and let it go through its environmental setup and of course with conda it goes in there and finds all the dependencies. Pip doesn't do as much as far as finding dependencies, but you know exactly what's on there with pip. So if you're doing a huge distribution, you probably want to use your uh, pip install so you can track what's going on there. With the um, conda, I like to just let it take over since this isn't a major distributed package going out. Another quick note between pip and conda is that if you start on a project in one of these environments and you're using pip in there, stick with pip. If you're using conda, stick with conda. They track the packages and you can run into some issues where they're not tracking the same packages and something gets overwritten. So it's important to stay very consistent with your uh, install on your environments. And we'll also need to go ahead and install our uh, numpy environment and our pandas on here. So go ahead and do that if you haven't added those packages in. Go ahead and install those into your uh, environment that you're working in. And of course pandas is just simply uh, install pandas. And let's just install a couple more packages. In this case let's get our uh, install our map plot library because we're going to plot at the end since we're going to be collecting data. And for this project that will be all the packages we'll need. So we can go ahead and close out of our installer or whatever setup you have. And we'll go back to home and we'll just launch our Jupyter Lab and that will open up in our browser window. Now if you're coming from Jupyter Notebooks and first time in lab we can go ahead and just create our first notebook Python 3. You can also do it under a file launcher and you'll see new notebook. It automatically opens up and we can just click right on there. It'll pop open on the left and I'll right click this and we'll rename this. We'll rename it uh, just beautiful. And it is a ipynb file on there. So that should look familiar because that's a Jupyter Notebook file. This is a new one. Now I have multiple tabs and in the past I usually hid this on the other computer all my notes for the lesson today. But this is my notes going down and we'll go ahead and just start going through this and see what it looks like to do a data 
pull from front to end and see how that works as a data scientist pulling that information in from the website. And the first thing I want to do is I want to go ahead and close the side window. That way it looks, get the nice full screen. And we can also up the size a little bit. One of the wonderful things about working in a browser window, just do that control plus thing. The package as we talked about is pandas. So we imported our pandas if you haven't already. That's our data frame. If you haven't done our pandas tutorial, definitely worthy of uh, the time to go through there and understand pandas because it's such a powerful tool. This basically turns your in data into a spread sheet data frame. Our numpy is our number array, uh, so it kind of works with pandas very closely as far as manipulating data in arrays. Map plot, we want to go ahead and bring that in, our PLT, so that we can plot the data at the end. And this line right here that says map plot library inline is for the Jupyter Notebook specifically. It tells it to print that on this page. A lot of the newer versions don't actually require to have that line. They'll still print it on the page. We should still include that if you're in the Jupyter Lab setup. And then we have our URL library dot request. We're going to import URL open for opening up the website. And then we have our BS4. And that's your beautiful soup 4. We're going to import beautiful soup. And then our last one is our RE. That is for manipulating our regular expressions. So when we get to that part of importing our data, we have to do a lot of reformatting so it's something we can use. And the RE is one of those tools. We'll go ahead and run this and just bring all that in. So this this is all imported. All these packages are now into our web scraping program we're going to run. Now if we're going to dive in and pull data, we should have a nice website to pull from. And let's go ahead and we'll use the um, HubbardTiming.com results for the 2018 Martin Luther King race. And if we take this, you can actually just take this, um, where did we get this from? Well you can go in here and find the website you're going to scrape from and you'll see right here it says you just copy that link right in there, that HTTP. Um, and this is the website that we're looking at. And you can see right here all the information that we're looking at. Let's say we wanted to run some statistics on this. It sure would be nice to be able to pull it off of here. And if they don't have a direct API, that means we need to pull it from their website. Some of these will have a download. Although if you've ever done it, we have a download click and maybe you're paging through 100 websites. Uh, in one case, I was uh, pulling all the different United States bills that are passed to track who voted on them uh, for a project. And you can imagine that there's, you know, hundreds hundreds and hundreds of those thousands of these documents that they voted on, who voted on it, it goes through the Senate, it goes back to the Congress. So I opened up a website, pull all the links off of there that match a certain criteria. And we'll look at that in just a minute, how we go through the HTML. And then I had to reformat them, or I could hand download each one, one at a time, which would just be a nightmare. So it's nice to automate it. In this case, we're going to be pulling up this chart. We want to figure out how to pull this chart off of this website. And so when we go back into our Jupyter Notebook, I've got my URL just um, our name for it and it's just a string that's all this is nothing fancy there you'll notice that on the uh, slashes we now have forward forward slash you can do a single forward and HTTP is a double forward this is just how hey, you have to switch it to match setup in there and then it's going to go ahead and use the HTML equals URL open URL and that's from our URL library request so it's opening a link to that website or at least pointing to it and if we run this this just sets it up so this is all set up and then once we've done our uh, setup, let's go ahead and create an object called soup. This will be, and if you remember up here, here's our beautiful soup that we imported from the BS4. Uh, and this is the package that we're working with. And so we're going to do our beautiful soup on here. And on this, we need to go ahead and send it our HTML so it knows what it's opening. And then the second part is we have to tell it how the format is coming in. And the most common one for your HTML polls is an LXML setup. And so almost all of them you'll end up using the LXML. There's a few other options. And because this is so common uh, in the newer versions, a lot of times they just leave it out just because it's already on the default. We'll go ahead and leave it in here just to remind us that it's there and we'll go ahead and run that. And on the newer versions, uh, they actually default it to the XML setup and the HTML. We'll just leave it out and call it HTML. So it's just going to pull from this URL. And when we run that on here, we've now created an object soup that has pulled the website into it. So soup contains the information along with information on that website and what's going on. So let's just go over what we did real quick before we start digging into the actual soup, before we start scooping out stuff. We imported our different um, modules that we're going to use with our package, specifically the beautiful soup. We did install the beautiful soup. If I remember correctly, you have to call it beautiful soup 4 
specifically so it knows what you're bringing in. And this line right here is very key from BS4 because that's how it installs the module. We're importing our beautiful soup. And then we found our URL. In this case, we're going to go pull information from the Martin Luther King Dream Run. And then we set our HTML to our URL open URL. And you can see right here we imported that. So here's our URL.request import URL open. So we're requesting a connection. And once we send that connection into the beautiful soup, it creates an object called soup. And then this one, of course, we chose soup just because it goes with beautiful soup. I guess we could have chosen beautiful. And now we can start extracting information from our website because we've pulled it down onto our computer under soup. And we can start by looking at the title of the website, soup.title. And if we print title dot text. You'll see this a lot in Beautiful Soup because title contains all kinds of information and if we want just the text from that title you add the dot text on the end. And you can see right here we have our 2018 MLK Dream Run 5k race results. If you look at the tab that's the actual title up here. Uh, 2018 MLK Dream Run 5k race. That's what the title is on the website. And then you might be curious what's in title? What's the whole title that it's storing up there? Well let's go ahead and print it out. Here's print title and print title.txt and when we run that you can see it has the HTML tags title on it and then the forward slash title to end it and so we're really just pulling off this piece of the HTML code and then we look at the text inside that particular part of the HTML and earlier I mentioned links what if you want to get all the links off this page oh well, that would be fun uh, we could do soup dot and we'll do find underscore all put this in bracket and then quotation marks we'll go ahead and put a a is the um, key find and you'll start seeing a div and all the different options you have for finding these entities in a website and then let's go ahead and just print our links and you can see here that it now shows all the different links in here that are marked by a because we did a find all a and then we can also because this is a little bit hard to pull off the h reference so we can also add in our find all fine tune that in this case the h reference equals true we'll actually filter that out and then finally we might do a uh, for link in links and we can simply do something like this for each link we want to actually find the h reference because we know there's an h reference in it and if i run this you can see it just comes through and prints them out one at a time some of these are really useful so you might be looking for something that has https in it and you know that's a link running to something else or you might be looking for the mail to tags so you know that's all the mail addresses but either way you can easily find all the links in your um, html document that you're paging through and of course um, any packages that have evolved over time you can also do link.get h reference which should do the same thing as our other format and you can see it certainly does we get the same printout up here in this particular case we really want to get the data off the page uh, so let's go ahead and do that let's see what that looks like and in data let's call it all rows there we go equals and then we have our soup dot find underscore all there's our brackets and then if we're looking for each row in a database you'll remember your HTML code we're looking for the tag TR so we want to find all TR and we can take this and let's go ahead and just take all our rows and do a print all rows and about this time you're gonna guess that we're gonna get a huge amount of information just dumped onto our page and sure enough we do if you look at this it just kind of goes on forever but this is an array each row is considered an array so because of that we can do something simply as putting brackets and just print the first let's do the first five rows so uh, from beginning to five and you can see here's our first five rows on here I sometimes like to just do let's just do row zero and we see that row zero is finishers finishers 191 and just out of curiosity what's if that's zero what's row one Mel okay so we're starting to see titles going across here so if we come up here and we do rows uh, we did what up to 10 let's just take a look and see what 10 does again and just take a look at that information that comes across place uh, bib name gender age city state chip chip paste gender and so on so it comes all the way down here we kind of have an ending right here and then we have one and then we actually it looks like we start
start to have information. So we have our 1, our 1, 1191, Max Randolph, that must be the name, Mel, 29, and so on. You can start seeing how the information starts getting displayed going down. So the next thing we want to do with this, and I'll go back up here and just edit the space we're in so it starts to make a little bit more sense. Keep it all together. And so we want to do for each row in all rows, we're looking at what information are we looking at? Well, we have our TH up here, that's the header, our TD down here, which looks like the individual information. And we really are looking for um, the actual data. So we're looking for our TD tags in the rows. And we can do that because when remember when it stores the row, it also stores the tags underneath that. So all rows have all the different tags in it. And you can see right here as you print each one of those out. And so when we look at each row, we can create another variable and we'll call it row list. And we'll set this equal to, in this case, row, because we've already pulled all the rows out of soup. So now we want to find for each row. And in there, we want to find our TD. And if we go ahead and just print, I'm going to do it. If you notice, I changed the indent. So I'm just going to print row list. What this does is the last value to go into row list. Our last row is going to print now. And of course, make sure you have an underscore instead of a period when you're typing. So row dot find underscore all TD. And if we print the last row, you can see I have all the data coming across here. We have our 191, our 1216, Zuma, Okcho. I hope I said that right. Female, I believe that's age 40, and so on. And then we can take our uh, row list, and there's a lot of things we can do with the row list. But we'll do for, let's do object, or let's just do cell in row list. And so we're going to look at each cell, because this is, if you look at this, they have commas separated between the different objects. And then we're going to go ahead and print cell.text. Let's just take a look and see what that looks like. And we can see here for each row we get 191, there's our 191, there's our 1216, 1216, our uh, uh, individual who's in the race, and so forth all the way down for those different settings. And let's go ahead and create a new variable up here. Uh, we'll call this all, let's just call it data. We'll keep it simple. Uh, so here's our data. And then we have our row. We take our row and we break it up into individual cells. So we'll call this um, data row, and we'll set this empty to an empty row. And we're going to take our uh, cells, tab this, and we know that each cell generates a text. And so what we want to do is I want to take my data row, let's just replace that. Let's take our data row, and let's append our cell.text. So I'm going to add the each row is going to be a row of the different text on here. And then once I create each row, I want my data, which is going to be everything, to append each row. And here's our data row. And then if we go ahead and come down here, and let's just print data. Now, if we were lurking with large data, we'd be very careful about just throwing all our data on the page. But you can see here, we throw the data on the page, and we get uh, finishers, 199, male, 78, female, 113, 1, and so on. And if you look at this, this is the headers on the file. We have finishers, uh, male, female. It's just like some general statistics on the first one. And then we have actually uh, um, a, an empty data set, and then we have our data that continues, which actually the you know, actual information we're looking for. So we have 1, 1191, Max Randolph, Mill, 29, Washington, D.C., Runtime, uh, 1 of 78, and so on on here. Uh, so we could really quickly get rid of that. A number of different ways to do that. One of them is just to do, we're going to set, if we do data 2 on, uh, we should get rid of everything, but we want to keep Randolph, so make sure Randolph is in there. Oh, we lost Randolph. Let's try 1 on. There we go. There's Max Randolph on there. Uh, so we can just simply do redo our data on here, and we can do data. Probably want to do it in all rows from one on, but I'm just going to do my data equals uh, data one on down here. And there's reasons to split it this way. In data science, sometimes you don't want to touch the original data in case you need it, in case we do need the first row. So we'll put it down here, and uh, maybe we'll just call this titles. Titles equals data of zero. And so we could do something here where we print, we'll print up our titles, and we'll print our data. In this case, instead of one on, let's go minus two. Let's look at the last two rows of data. So here we have our titles, and uh, for some reason just put in uh, finishers of 191. I was expecting a little bit more up there. And we have our last couple people, and they look like the data on these looks just fine on here. Turns out this is just some generic statistics up here. So we'll get rid of titles completely. It doesn't really do us any good. But we know that data comes in here, and we can look at our data and look at the very end of the data too, the minus two to the end. And we can see it pulls the data in pretty good. We 
don't have anything too funky in here we're looking at. It looks pretty clean. Now you got to be a little careful because at some point we might have to come back here and clean up the data if we get an error for running a data analysis. We might find out there's some unusual characters or something is misset in the data itself. And you also notice that everything is a string. So when we're bringing it in, we might have to do some conversions to test it out and convert them to whatever kind of data format we're working with. So at this time, we want to go ahead and bring in our pandas. Um, and let's go ahead and call this df for data frame. We'll set it equal to, and if you remember correctly, we imported pandas as pd, and that's standard. You'll see that in most code examples where they call, they import pandas as pd, um, and it is capital D, capital F for data frame. And we're just going to bring in our uh, data. That's what we called it on here. And let's uh, take this and we'll print. Now, when you're working with data frames, you're usually talking large amounts of data. And so you almost never want to print the whole data frame out. Uh, we're going to go ahead and do that anyway, just so we can see what that looks like. And you can see in here, brings in our uh, data frame coming in here. And we just have a mess of information. This is our data. Let's go ahead and print DF and see what that looks like in the data frame. And this is nice because it organizes it into a very easy to read table. And we have, uh, they set the label 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on. And then we have each row. Uh, we have mail, uh, 78, none, 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 going across. When we get all the way down here, we'll see Max Randall about number three. And the first thing this does is this flags me that I brought in a bunch of information up here that we really didn't want. Uh, it's from three on that we want. And we can clean this up in one of two ways. Uh, we can try to clean it up under the data, or we can clean it up under the data frame, depending on what it is we're trying to do. And so to fix this, um, I want to go ahead and just change it up here in the actual data pull-in. We don't need that information. So I'll rerun it, reload our data from four on. And then when I run this, we see we have Max Randolph is right at the top of the list like he should be. And we have all the data going down. Now with the data frame, remember I said we don't usually print the whole data frame. We'll go ahead and do df.head. And this prints the first five rows. And you can see that we have uh, 13 columns. Here's Max Randall all the way to Theo Kinman. And I usually also print df. Tell. And the reason I like to do these particular two setups, and I'm going to change it just to two rows, because you can do that, you can print as many rows as you want, is it's good to look at the first part and the end, because those are usually where you have extra data brought in, uh, something's messed up. And you can also see that we have 190 rows in here. And it comes in with our uh, Zulma, Leisha, and they're both on here on the list. So now we have a nice data frame, uh, columns and rows. We can easily look at it, we can see the setup on here, and we can look at the names and everything. Now, at some point, Point, you might be looking at these individual columns and find different information that needs to be re-edited. If you can, you try to do it with the whole column under pandas. You can up in the upper part of the code where you went from cell to cell or row to row. You can look at individual cells. Maybe you find a marker in that cell that's something specific, like remove all colons or semicolons or something in there, or brackets. So there's a lot of options in there. But you'll find that this one actually comes in pretty clean on here all the way down. And the next thing we really want to do is we want to look at the headers. Um, I don't know about you, but it doesn't make any sense to me when I have column one, I don't know what 1191 is or 1080. Need name Kaiser Runner. I'm guessing that's column two is names. Third one, it looks like male or female, probably age, but I don't want to guess. I want this to bring in my column so I know exactly what I'm looking at. So how can we make beautiful soup do that for us? Well, let's take our column headers. And we're going to set that equal to our soup, find underscore all, and then we're going to look for our headers, our th files. And since we're in Jupyter Lab, in this case, Jupyter uh, Notebook, Book, I can just type out column headers. If it's the last variable I have listed, it'll automatically print it. So it's kind of a shorthand. And we can see right here we have place, I'm guessing that's bib, name, gender, age, city, state, chip time, chip pace, and so on. So we have all our headers right there. I shouldn't have to type them all in. And we'll go ahead and do it before. We'll go ahead and do a uh, header list equals our um, empty array. And then we can do for a column in column headers. And we can take our header list and just append. And what do we want? We want the text from the column. So we'll just do column.text. And then if we come down here and we print our header list, let's see what that looks like. If we did it right, we should get a nice list of all the different column headings we want. So we have place, bib, name, and so on. 
And then pandas, just because pandas is so cool, we can simply do df columns equals our header from our header list. We can simply set df columns set to df headers, and then if I print df.head, we'll take a look at that, and we'll see right here it has nicely placed our values on here. Place, bib, name, gender, age, and so on. So very quickly, we've created this nice data frame. We have the data displayed in nice rows and columns and easy to read. And then as a data scientist, the first thing we want to know is the info. What is in these columns and rows and headers? And you see right here, they all come up with non-null object. There's a big flag. So if I want to do anything with this, these are all coming through as uh, strings or an object. I usually mean strings in this case, that they're a string variable. And we have, you can quickly read through this, uh, 191 entries, date columns, total 14 columns. There's a total of 14 columns in the data, and it shows you all the different names and what type of column they are. And it's probably good also to look at the shape of the data, df.shape. We'll go ahead and just run that. You can see it's 191 by 14, 14 columns, 191 entries. This is more like a, the way you look at a numpy array, 191 by 14 for the shape. And remember, this is a variable, so if I put it on, if it's a last variable or last uh, value in the uh, set of cells, Jupyter automatically prints it out. So if you're in a different IDE, you'd want to go ahead and use the print statement on here. Uh, and then one of the things you'd want to also go through, we'll call, create a second one, df2 equals df dot drop in a. Now the axes is automatically equal to zero. So a lot of times you'll see something like axes equals zero, comma, how equals any. Axes equals zero is default. That means we're looking at going down the rows. You could look at the column going across. Let's remove the how any because that's just going to confuse you. The axes is, is whether you're going down the columns or if you're looking at it uh, row by row by row by row. Or you could be looking at it by column by column by column. This would drop any column and it would drop off uh, the NA in any column. And how equals, and we want any. I always confuse all and any because they both start with A. All means that all of them have to be non-value, where any means that any of them can be there to drop it. So this would drop any column with a null value in it. But we want zero, and it'll drop any value with a null value. And then because zero is always the default, we'll just leave it out. And then it's curious as to what the shape is now. Did we lose anything? Was there any null values in our DF2 that we dropped from the DF? And we'll go ahead and run that. Uh, and we see 191 and 14. So we didn't really drop anything. But it's always good to check. There's other ways you can also do, are there, let's see, any NAs? You can detect NAs in here. Null values, infinite values. That's another one you got to watch out for. We're working with data that we're going to do something with here in a minute. So you got to be a little careful also in the conversions. Are you going to convert something? Thing where people typed in weird characters to describe the data a certain way. So now we've got to this point where we have all our different columns, we have our different data, and um, at this point maybe you're asking, or maybe the uh, shareholder of the company is asking, hey, can we look at the, um, based on the chip time, here's our chip time, can we plot that versus gender? How does gender versus chip time compare? And so we can do that. We can take that. And the first thing we look at is we say, hey, well, chip time came in as a string. And that's going to be an issue. Now, there's a number of ways you can change this. One of them is we could go all the way back up here where we created the data and find a way to tag it and say, hey, whenever um, this cell text, maybe instead of appending this, I notice that any time there's two colons in it, that's probably a time signature. And let's uh, convert all the time signatures to date time field or whatever. A lot of times you don't get that. Uh, you don't get that option. And that's always a question in bringing in data. Whether you convert the data coming in at the beginning, or do you wait till you have it, open it up, and then convert it when you go to use it. Uh, we're going to go ahead and convert it after we get it into our data frame. So we have our DF2 here. Uh, we've dropped all of our NAs. We dropped our. We have a shape. Uh, in fact, let's do this. Since there's no difference between DF and DF2, well, we'll just go ahead and use DF2. Uh, so let's go ahead and take our DF2, and we want to take those that specific field and convert it into some kind of numerical value we can use. And let's add another column. Uh, a lot of times this is uh, something you want to do is where you want to go ahead and keep all the original columns and just add a new column in there. And this new column is going to be based on the, if we remember correctly, we had chip time. That's what we're going to look at. Okay, we want chip time versus gender. If we go into our pandas, we find out we have uh, pandas to delta, and this is actually time delta. And then we just want to take our df2, and we're going to use the chip time column. 
So this is going to say, hey, let's look at, uh, let's convert everything in DF2 chip time into a time delta format. That's the data type we're going to put it as. And we can go ahead and just run this. And if we go in here and we do info, uh, DF2, and we'll keep our, uh, we're going to look at this particular column, but we want to keep it as a data frame. Uh, so this is a list of all the columns we want to look at. We'll just do dot info on here and run that. And we do an info on that. You can see it's now a uh, time delta 64 nanoseconds. Uh, well, we really don't want nanoseconds. We actually probably want to do it in minutes. Uh, so let's take a look at that. And let's take this whole thing, DF2. Let's just set the DF2. We have our DF2. This is a column we're working with here. And we can use the as type property in pandas. And so we can set this equal to uh, DF2. We'll take our same uh, column in here. And we'll set it as type time delta second. So it's still a delta time here. So if I run this, you'll see that it still comes up as, where is it? Oh, it turns it into a float. So we're now at a float 64. So it's a number of seconds in that delta time. And then finally, uh, we want to go ahead and turn that from seconds to, say, minutes. And, you know, there's 60 seconds in minutes. And so now we divide by 60. We still have a float. We have our info. It shows us it's a float. And then we can go ahead and just do a uh, print DF2. And let's just keep it small. We don't want to look at all our data. We just want to do the head of it. And we run this, and you can see right here where we go to it'll be the last one. Here's our chip time in minutes. And a lot of times, uh, just to make life easy for viewing, since we're only looking at this particular element, uh, we can do chip time in minutes. And now we just see that oops, we take off. We'll go ahead and take off our info. I'm done with that. And we'll run this. And you can see we have our minutes. 16.8 minutes, 17.51 minutes, and so on. It's a float number. Now keep in mind, this is 0.8. That's not a 16 minutes and 80 seconds. That, they can always throw you if you're going through so many numbers you forget. So important to remember that. And we're also going to look at, uh, the other one we're looking at is what? Gender. We want to look at gender to chip time in minutes. And so we can see here under the head, we get uh, mail, 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 and a number of different setups. And let's switch this to tail real quick and just look at the uh, end of it. And here we have female, female, male, female, female. So we have two different genders and we have our chip time in minutes. And if you remember, we brought in our PLT. If you haven't used the plot library, the map plot library, you have a drawing place you're putting stuff on. So we have our PLT, we're gonna do a bar graph. And we just wanna simply use our DF2 gender and DF2 uh, chip time in minutes. So that's going to plot the two bars. And to make it pretty, we'll go ahead and give it the X label gender, the Y label chip time minutes. And that simply is, remember it always plots X and it plots Y. We have our gender, our chip time. Give it a nice title. Uh, comparison of average minutes run by male and female. Uh, and if we go ahead and run this with the correct titles in here and everything matches, uh, you'll get a nice graph. We can see here the comparison of average minutes run by male and female. Here's our chip time in minutes. The men seem to be slackers in this particular case. And it's actually, uh, um, there's a number of studies that show that women te tend to have, uh, as far as doing cross country, there's a lot of women who have a longer endurance than men. So it's not too surprising. Uh, but we can see here the average chip time around 70 and for women uh, over 100 minutes. And then another really cool thing we can do is we can describe the data. Uh, so df2.describe, this again is a pandas function, just like info is. And we're going to include a NP number, the numpy number. And if we run that, you'll see here it comes up and it says uh, chip time in minutes, uh, count, it gives you the average or the mean, standard deviation, the minimum, the maximum, um, all the different descriptive information you're going to want from your data set on there. And just because there's all kinds of fun ways, uh, let's do a box plot to display your information. Uh, we can do a box plot where the column equals chip time in minutes. And let's go ahead and run that. Keep uh, mistyping my chip time in minutes. And you can see it puts out a nice uh, box plot showing you the information. We have our uh, different values and floaters. And this is always interesting because this is a nice way of seeing where we have these uh, floaters. One up here and there's two up above. And of course you're, um, you're a nice spread on the box plot. And we can also uh, modify this a little bit and we can add in uh, by equals gender and then we'll give it a we'll just give it a blank title. I don't know why we're giving it a blank title. Uh, we'll just add a y plot y label on there for runtime. And if we run this you can see here box plot group by gender, chip time in minutes. And now we have our female and male two different areas and you can see how they vary you have your two different 
uh, your outlier up here, and you can also see how there's such an overlap between the two different values. Uh, so if I was looking at this, I'd be like, wow, you know, I, I really could not draw a conclusive thing on this saying that women's runtime was more in general because they overlap too much. That would be one of the conclusions I'd have to come up with done here. And then we get to uh, maybe the partners come in from the company and say, hey, we'd like to know the age versus chip time in minutes. That'd be something worth uh, knowing on the statistics on this. And the first thought is we can simply plot it. And we can do this. We can actually plot the scatter plot chip time versus uh, DF2 of age. Those are XY coordinates. But if you remember from DF2, when we did the info, let's go way back up here. Uh, we're looking at a data object as far as our chip time on this and our age. Now we converted the chip time, but we also need to convert the age. And if we do it right here, we just plot it. And it'll actually let us plot it. It shouldn't. It should give us an error, but it does let us plot it. You'll see the ages come up a mess over here because they're converting it to weird float numbers and all kinds of things. So what we want to do is we want to take our age and we'll just call this age underscore i. So we're going to take our age and we're going to create another column for df2 age underscore i. And the i is just going to stand for integer. It's our own choice of values. There is a number of ways to do this. But we're going to do uh, pandas to meric is the best way in pandas. And the reason we're doing this is that that numeric creates a float value. Uh, so right off the bat, we want all our stuff converted. It converts it to the least common denominator. So if they're all integers already, you'll get integers. As you can see from here, it's doing some kind of conversion that converts it to a float value. The other thing that numeric does is if there's a null value or they put in like a blank line or a dash to represent no information, uh, it'll convert it to a uh, null. Uh, so it goes from like a string to a null versus just having some kind of made up number that Python somehow created for the graph we have below. And then we want to add our df2 age, because that's what we're converting to numeric, and then we want to coerce it. And there's a couple different options on this, like you can have it where it just doesn't process it in pandas, but coerce means that if it gets a weird value, that is a null value now. And since we're dealing with errors, this, this is what happens when you get an error converting it, we want to coerce it, there we go, and put the end bracket on there. And then finally we want to go ahead and round this off. So we'll put brackets around all the way around it, and this rounds off everything in this series. So what we've done here is I've taken df2 age, which is a D type object, which in this case is mostly strings with a couple of blank ones in there, and we're going to convert it to a numeric, which will automatically go to float, and then we're going to take wherever there's an error, wherever it says, hey, this doesn't convert, and usually that's a blank screen. Like I said, I've worked with so many databases where they someone puts down none, someone types in space, some types in a dash to mean none, and you get this really weird conversion coming up. This covers all of that in pandas. So it's really a nice way of just coercing it and saying, hey, if we don't have a number in there, let's make it a null value. And then we're going to round it off. And then finally, let's go ahead and take our df2. Uh, here's our df2. And let's drop those null values, drop na. And we want how, how equals any. So that means if there's any null values in the data set. Now, you can be, this might get you in trouble because you might have null values in a different column. And so you might lose uh, data that way. Um, at this point, we could also do like certain parts of like drop just certain columns with null values. There's all kinds of other options in here. But we're just going to do how we're going to just drop any. And we want to do it in line equals true. So that means it's going to reassign it to um, DF2. Uh, so DF2 now has uh, rounded out. So it's rounded to the integer. We didn't do any places the age, and it's going to be age i, and then we've dropped all our null values. That way we're not going to get any errors when we try to plot a null value. And it also makes sure that data, uh, by deleting out the rows, because that's what this does, it automatically does axis 0, which is your rows, axis 1 is your columns. By doing this, it automatically removes all the rows with null values. Uh, so it just cleans out the rows. And then when we go ahead and plot this, we see we have a nice clean data, and we have age all the way up to 70. Uh, so we have our chip time set, and then our age going across. And it makes a nice plot that you can easily show uh, for display and for the, the um, and you can easily show that to your shareholders or whatever group you're working on. It makes a really nice and quick, easy display. And with that, uh, thank you for joining us today, you know, for uh, a quick look at the beautiful soup and the web scraping tools in Python. Again, thank you for joining us with Simply Learn. This is www.simplylearn.com. Get certified, get ahead. Richard Kirshner, have a good day. Happy learning and uh, look to see you in classes. If you have any questions, feel free to post them on the bottom of the YouTube. We do go back and look at those questions and answer them. And you can also visit us at our website. We have a number of different communities and
and forums there where you can ask questions concerning programming, web scraping, data science, uh, and just about any kind of certification program out there you can imagine. Hi there, if you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.